Welcome to the Daily Bible Reader Podcast. I am your host, Rakia Collins, and the mission of this podcast is to read the Bible from beginning to end every single year, starting in 2024. If that mission sounds interesting to you, I'd encourage you to grab your Bible and read along with me. On today's episode, we are going to be reading Exodus chapter 32 through Exodus chapter 34. So shifting to Exodus chapter 32, the golden calf. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Make up gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down, for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, in order that I may make a great nation out of you. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt? with great power and with a mighty hand. Why should the Egyptians say, with evil intent did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, and of this land I have promised I will give to your offspring, they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. And Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, tablets that were written on both sides, On the front and on the back, they were written. The tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, engraved on the tablets. When Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. But he said, It is not the noise of a shouting for victory or the sound of a cry of defeat, but the sound of singing that I hear. And as soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses' anger burned hot, and he threw the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf that they had made and burned it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it on the water and made the people of Israel drink it. And Moses said to Aaron, What did this people do to you that you have brought such a great sin upon them? And Aaron said, 
Let not your anger of my Lord burn hot. You know the people, they are set on evil, for they said to me, Make us gods who shall go before us. And as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So I said to them, Let any of you who have gold take it off. So they gave it to me, and I threw it into the fire and came out this calf. And when Moses saw that the people had broken loose, for Aaron had let them break loose to the derision of their enemies, then Moses stood in the gates of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered around him. Then he said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Put your sword on your side, each of you, and go to and fro from gate to gate throughout the camp, and each of you kill his brother and his companion and his neighbor. And the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And that day, about 3,000 men of the people fell. And Moses said, Today you have been ordained for the service of the Lord, each one at the cost of his son and his brother, so that he might bestow a blessing upon you this day. The next day, Moses said to the people, You have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people has sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold. But now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. But the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. Now go, lead the people to the place about which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. Then the Lord sent a plague on the people because they made the calf, the one that Aaron made. Okay, so chapter 32, there is so much in this chapter that I want to break down. So I'm going to start from the very beginning of chapter 32. So really going, just really verse 1 where it says that the people saw that Moses delayed in coming down the mountain. And so they gathered themselves together around Aaron and they said to him, "Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And so I wanted to start there because I think that really speaks to a lot of us as humans, when things don't really go the way that we expect them to go, or we can't see an end in sight, or we think we see an end in sight, we oftentimes don't seek God's instruction and we don't seek what is he trying to say to us. Rather, we do what we want to do. And so in this moment, we see the Israelites do what they think is best, and that is to get Aaron to make them a separate God that's different from God and to serve that God. It's just, it's honestly tragic because up until this point, of course, we've heard them make the promise to God, give in covenant that they are going to, you know, serve God, worship God. And then the moment that they're like, hey, we still don't see Moses. We don't know where he is, we're going to just go ahead and make another God. And so the next thing that I want to focus on on this chapter is while God is up there at the top of the mountain, he is angry. His anger is kindled and he is ready to do away with the Israelites. So what I want to focus on is not so much the anger of God, but Moses's response or kind of how he deals with that situation. Mind you, this is the God of the universe and Moses, an 80, 90, probably at this point in time, year old man on this mountain. So verse 11, but Moses implored the Lord, his God, and said, 
O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, with evil intent did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and all this land that I have promised, I will give to your offspring and they shall inherit it forever. And then in verse 14, the Lord relented for the, from the disaster that he had spoken to bring on his people. I love that dialogue. And the reason why I love that dialogue is because while I started at verse 11, we know in verse 10, God was like, I'm going to go down there and wipe them out. And I'm going to make you a nation. We're, we're going to start with you, Moses, because you get it. You're my friend. You understand. I love Moses's response here because it speaks to his character. It speaks to his character in a way that I don't know if many of us were on that mountain with God. I don't know if we would have had this type of response. Moses, not having yet seen the situation, he hasn't yet seen it. All he knows is that God is angry because of what God said, that these people have made for themselves a golden calf and they're worshiping it. And so Moses hasn't yet seen this sight for himself since he's still with God. But what I love is that in response to this, Moses doesn't say, yes, build me a people, make me a great person. Like that's what we need to do. I'm the plan moving forward. It's about me. Moses is not a narcissist. Moses chooses to say, remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, and all this land I have promised I will give to your offspring. I love this because he's not focusing on himself like many of us probably would have. He's focusing on, okay, God, I completely understand why you're upset, but remember what you said. And not only did you say this, God, you swore by yourself your own self. We haven't gotten to this portion of the Bible yet, but there is a scripture where God says he looked throughout the world and couldn't find anyone else to swear by. So he swears by himself. And that's one thing that as I'm reading the word for the second time all the way through, reminding God or being in a position to say to God, remember that this is what you said. Not so much that God forgets, but because you are equipped with the scriptures in this book to be able to bring them to God and to remind him of what he said and that this is the promise that you're standing on. This is applicable if you are in right standing with him, if you are in good standing and in righteousness with God, you're doing his commandments, you're listening to his word, you are in right standing or right positioning with him by obeying the laws, commands, decrees that he's passed down. I love this. Like, I can't tell you guys enough, like how much I love this because Moses is not about self. Moses is on, remember what you said and remember that you swore by yourself. And that for me, that is just pivotal. And so as we keep moving down in this chapter, we see that Moses actually goes down off of the mountain. And we see that his aide, Joshua, is like, well, I hear a cry coming from the camp, but it doesn't sound like a war cry. It sounds like something else. So eyebrows are at this point starting to be raised. And then we see here in verse 19, and as soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses' anger burned hot. And he threw the tablets out of his hand. These are the tablets that God wrote. And he threw them out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf that they had made and burned it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it on the water. 
and made the people of Israel drink it. I think that that within itself just that that speaks. I have nothing nothing to say on that verse because yeah, that's just Moses did what he did. He said what he said. It was what it was. And so at this point, now we're going to go through a few verses. We're going to get down to verse 30. So at this point, Moses has led a group of people, the Levites, who he's like, hey, if you're with me, come over here. And then the tribe of Levi came over to him. And ultimately, they killed the other people. Like, not all of them, but they went through and they killed them. It says in verse 28, the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And that day, about 3,000 people fell. And Moses said, today you have been ordained for the service of the Lord, each one at the cost of his son and of his brother, so that he might bestow a blessing upon you this day. Man, it's the reality of this text that God warned them, do not bow down and worship other gods because they will be a snare to you. That's why he didn't want them dwelling amongst these people because they will be a snare to them. And at this point, we don't even know if any other people influenced them to build this golden calf. All we know for sure is that they were tired of waiting on Moses and they thought Moses was dead. And that's why they went and tried to force, not even try, successfully um, forced Aaron to, to build this calf for them. And so dropping down to verse 30, we see that the next day Moses said to the people, you have sinned a great sin and now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Listen to this, verse 31. Moses returned to the Lord and said, alas, this people has sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold. But now if you will forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. Moses is so committed to, I don't know if it's just his own humbleness, if it's just his character. He is just committed to the point where he's like, even if I am in your book and I have done right, if my people are going to fall, I am going to fall with my people. And then to go back in the presence of God and say, this is what it is. Like, if you have to blot them out, blot me out with them. And then we drop down to verse 33, where God says, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. But now go lead the people to the place about which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. So this isn't even to say that what Moses did for the 3,000 men that died, that's not even God's wrath. That's not even God punishing them for their sin. That's not it. This was a chapter, guys, I had to and am probably still going to continue to chew on and continue to just allow to marinate with me because there are a lot of things in this chapter that I can't say I fully understand or fully even grasp, but the things that I do grasp and I do understand, I did want to mention them to you guys, but I think chapters like this where we get to see God's justice, we get to see God's anger, we get to see a lot of different facets and a lot of different sides of the God that we serve. These are the types of chapters that you really have to sit and really pray and really allow the Holy Spirit to really speak to you for you to have the level of understanding and discernment that you need to be well equipped to continue to forge on as you read a chapter like this that has different layers and different mixtures of complexity. Exodus chapter 33, the command to leave Sinai. The Lord said to Moses, depart. Go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up out of Egypt, to the land to which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, To your offspring I will give it. I will send my angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites and the Amorites 
the Hittites, the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. When the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, Say to the people, You are a stiff-necked people. If for a single moment I shall go up among you, I would consume you. So now take off your ornaments, that I may know what to do with you. Therefore, the people of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Horab onward. The Tent of Meeting Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp, and he called it the Tent of Meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the Tent of Meeting, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up and each would stand at his tent door, watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of the cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship, each at his tent door. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Moses' intercession. Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways, that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider too that this nation is your people. And he said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, If your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, This very thing that you have spoken I will do, for you have found favor in my sight and I know you by name. Moses said, Please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to you. I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he said, You cannot see my face, for a man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. So for chapter 33's commentary, I really had A couple of things I wanted to highlight. The first one comes from really verses two through verse six. So this is where we see that Moses is talking to the people and essentially telling the people what God told him that this is the land that you guys need to go into and that God isn't going with you. And so picking up with verse four, when the people heard this disastrous word, They mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, Say to the people of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. If for a single moment I should go up among you, I would consume you. So now take off your ornaments that I may know what to do with you. That is a disastrous word, I'm not going to lie. To know that. It's like, to me, I like to look at this as disappointing 
a father or the person that raised you, like knowing that you did something that they just was like super disappointed in, it's just you never want to feel that feeling. Knowing that you disappointed someone that has done nothing but like looked out for you and been there for you and supported you and you do something that wasn't good and you're sorrowful for it, but sometimes it takes more than just a sorry. And so that's really what I see when I see these verses. And then if we drop down to the very last piece of this chapter, this is where, again, we see Moses being Moses, man. Moses is going to intercede. So this is verse 14 where God is talking to Moses and God says, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And he said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight? I and your people, is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct? I and your people from every other people on the face of the earth. I love this because we have to recognize and know that even in today's age, God is what really makes us distinct from other people on the planet. It is his presence. It is his provision. It is his going with us to make the crooked paths straight that allow us to be where we are and have what we have in our lives. And it's so powerful to me that people sometimes don't realize that, but It's amazing that Moses, the great, amazing leader that he is, still recognizes and is humble enough to know, listen, I am nothing without you. From the moment that you got me from that burning bush and brought me back here to save these people, you have been with me. You cannot leave me. If you leave, there's no distinction. We have no distinction. Me and this people, we have no distinction if you're not there. I don't know, guys. There is just, I'm not saying that we should want to be like anyone in the Bible, but I think that there are characteristics and traits that we can hope to embody. And the humbleness of Moses, his willingness to intercede for those around him, even though in this context, Moses was talking face to face with God. He did nothing wrong with that calf and that situation that happened at the bottom of the mountain, but he is still willing to be the leader that he is, and he is still willing to intercede for them. I think that is outstanding. I think that is amazing. And it really speaks to the level of leadership that we all should strive to embody, especially as we go out in the world and we proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord. You have to have a level of leadership that says, I will intercede for you I will try my best to step in on your behalf. You may get turned down the same way that God turned down Moses and said, hey, I am going to blot out who I'm going to blot out. I'm not blotting out you because you did nothing wrong to me. But again, it is his, it is his humbleness. It is his willingness. It is his character that I believe we are lacking in 2024. We need leaders, especially godly people of the kingdom that are willing to stand up and that are willing to go out and that are willing to intercede for those that may be lost, that may not know the path. It is our job to make sure that we do whatever we can to help bring them closer to God. Chapter 34, Moses makes new tablets. The Lord said to Moses, cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. Be ready by the morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. No one shall come up with you and no one Be seen throughout all the mountain. Let no flocks or herds graze opposite that mountain. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first, and he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him, and took in his hand two tablets of stone. The Lord descended in the cloud 
and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the inequity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. And he said, If now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for your inheritance. The covenant renewed, and he said, Behold, I am making a covenant. Before all your people I will do marvels, such as have not been created in all the earth or in any nation. And all the people among whom you are shall see the work of the Lord, for it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. Observe what I command you this day. Behold, I will drive out before you the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Take care, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land to which you go, lest it become a snare in your midst. You shall tear down their altars and break their pillars and cut down their ashram. For you shall worship no other God. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and when they whore after their gods and sacrifice to their gods, and you are invited, you eat of his sacrifice, and you take of their daughters for your sons, and their daughters whore after their gods, and make your sons whore after their gods. You shall not make for yourself any gods of cast metal. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, as I commanded you, at the time appointed in the month of Bib, for in the month of Bib you came out from Egypt. All that open the womb are mine, all your male livestock, the firstborn of cow and sheep, the firstborn of donkey, you shall redeem with the lamb, or if you will not redeem it, you shall break its neck. All the firstborn of your sons, you shall redeem, and none shall appear before me empty-handed. Six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall rest in plowing time and in harvest you shall rest. You shall observe the feast of weeks, the first fruits of wheat harvest, and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. Three times in the year shall all your males appear before the Lord God, the God of Israel. For I will cast out nations before you and enlarge your borders. No one shall covet your land when you go up to appear before the Lord your God three times in the year. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with anything leavened, or let the sacrifice of the feast of the Passover remain until the morning. The best of the first fruits of your ground you shall bring to the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. The Lord said to Moses, Write these words, for in accordance with these words, I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. So he was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water, and he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments, the shining face of Moses. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, As he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterward, 
all the people of Israel came near, and he commanded them all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. Whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the people of Israel what he was commanded, the people of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face was shining, and Moses would put the veil over his face again until he went in to speak with him. So my commentary for Exodus chapter 34 really comes from where we see the covenant being renewed and we see that God is giving them instructions on how to keep the feast of unleavened bread and how to make sure that they are staying in line with his commandments. And I actually love the very end of this chapter where we see the shining face of Moses Again, more so about the principle that when you are in the presence of the Most High, you don't leave the way that you came. You come out very, very different. Like you're not the same person that you were before. And that's very critical. It's very critical to know that when you are in the presence of God, when you're in the presence of the King, You're not going to be in his presence and then come back and look the same, talk the same, be the same. And so I say that because as you are embarking on this journey of continuing to read the word every single day and strengthening your relationship with God, strengthening your relationship with Jesus and the Holy Spirit, do not be afraid to have a shining face like Moses. Do not be afraid to have people look at you and say, you've changed, or you're different. You are expected to be different when you spend time with God, when you dive into his word, when you really apply the things that he's told us to apply to our lives, you are going to be different. So never be ashamed or never feel afraid of the fact that, man, like I'm doing something that's different, that your people may not necessarily agree with or may not necessarily like. Don't even think twice about it. It is an expectation that you are going to be different from being in the presence of the king. And it is something that I hope with time, if you have not already embraced it, that you begin to embrace it. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. I hope you found some value out of this content. If you did, please leave me a rating or review wherever you are listening. This would mean the absolute world to me. And I'd love to hear from you on social media. Please feel free to reach out on Twitter at His Eternal Word, the number one. And please feel free to visit the website at www.thedailybiblereader.com. And I hope you stay tuned for the next episode.